Patrick, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Trace Talks. I'm super excited to have you here. Uh, and we're just going to dive into everything PCB. Wow. And uh, first, I want you to you know, tell us a little bit about yourself, give us your background, and, and tell us about your career. Oh, it's awesome to be here. Thank you so much for having me here. I really appreciate it. About myself. Oh, one of my least favorite topics. <laughs> um, been in the field for about 25, almost 30 years now. Uh, I was a knuckle dragon PCB designer for a very long time, and I say that. I love that field. Um, the idea of uh, the design, uh, doing a three-dimensional puzzle limited by manufacturing and physics and time has always been a challenge that I love to do. Um, I kind of started out in the PCB design um, through my father. Uh, he was a signal integrity expert in the oh. field. So a lot of my first bit of designs was working with him at our own company, um, Summit Computer Systems, which is long since gone. But uh, he did consulting all over the valley, and so we were introduced all over to the people and solving the signal integrity and power integrity problems. So I kind of learned and cut my teeth with that, doing the PCB design side when he was doing the SIPI side. That's so interesting. I just got to pause you there. So yes. I didn't realize there was this connection here. So yeah. I got into the business because of my dad. Yep. And it sounds like you got into the business because of your dad yep. a little bit. Is that it right? was. I actually, I wanted to go into public policy and be a city planner and city manager. Okay. Um, so that's where my career and my education went. But what ended up happening is uh, the jobs weren't there. <laughs> so my dad said, hey, you've kind of done this a little bit. Why don't you just do a couple PCB designs here and just until you can find something. And I fell in love with it. Nice. And so I kind of walked in like most of us walk in through the back door on something and going, wow. That's a, I always say to be a PCB designer, it's a special kind of stupid because <laughs> um, you sit inside this dark room and you design and you got this thing and you get into your own head. Um, some people can do it and some people can't. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I did that for a number of years. Um, right. Then I was a, from there went into a uh, Millennium Design okay. uh, where I was one of the owners. Okay. Um, from there, from Millennium Design, we actually merged in with another company, Rocket EMS. Okay. And from there, I kind of like worked my way up. I was, uh, and I left Rocket EMS as a senior vice president of design. Wow. Um, which was fun. That was actually a challenge and uh, learned a lot there. Yeah. So t talk a little bit about Rocket EMS, like how, when you first started there, you know, where were you? And then your big transitions or learnings because leaving at such a high post, right? So tell us a little bit more about that. So Rocket EMS was a great learning experience. Um, they, we started out, we merged with them with Michael Kotke. Uh, Scott Shetsley is one of the uh, really great guy. And he set this up with Michael Kotke and we kind of merged together. Um, we started off right after Rocket started. Um, and basically when there was a design internal, uh, internal design firm, um, for rocket EMS. And we kind of grew up inside of it. Um, after cadence, or sorry, as rocket grew, um, things changed always. And we're always learning, always doing something. But the biggest thing I got out of it was, uh, how important DFM is and also watching the manufacturing line. My office door opened up onto the manufacturing line. We had two facilities. We had one around here when we first started and then where they are now. Um, and I think they're up to four facilities or three. I, I've lost track of them, actually. Um, but watching the manufacturing line and watching the talent on the line make things happen really taught me a lot about design and engineering. Um, when you're out there, I used to walk around uh, stressed out, and they, they ran two shifts, three shifts. So at 1 o'clock in the morning, 11 o'clock at night, I could walk around and talk to everybody and watch what the, fan, what the, uh, what the uh, line workers were doing. Something I recommend for everybody to do. Oh, I learned more about design from watching how they overcome our mistakes in the design process to make it look right, and they did it again and again and again. Um, Learning the DFM process, truly learning it. We set the team up. We had a uh, DFM team in, in, in uh, Bangalore. And uh, amazing team. They're, those guys are just awesome. I do miss them. A um, very good friend of mine is actually the one who runs that over there. And uh, I learning how that process came together and working with them, 
was another big educational. It's like, I understand that. It's every says, oh, DFM's easy. No, it's not. There's so much to it. There's so much happening. It took years for that to get fine-tuned and put in place. So if I'm a PCV designer, like, give me some nuggets from this part of your experience. Like, how should, as a PCV designer, how should I incorporate some of that into my design practice? Um, you know, what are some best practices that I can follow? Best practices. If you get a chance, and that's, your website is awesome because you're going to pay, hey, come out, talk to us, see the tours and everything else, do that. Absolutely. We're very transparent. Very transparent. And watch it. Ask questions. Let me give you a couple examples. Um, as a designer, I hate rails. I got to put break off rails on a, on a board or something else like this. It's like, why? It's not that big of a deal. Right. Just put it into a carrier and let it go through it. Watching what they have to go through when it goes into a carrier, watching what the rails really do and how much faster the process happens was kind of set me aside. Okay, and now I'm starting to understand it. The handling. One of the things that I learned most was how do you limit the damage that happens when you're handling the boards? I'm sure that's you guys so have that problem. That's very true, yeah. Every, and less handling, the better. Less handling. Less times you have to have somebody touch the board, right. the higher probability of it working the first time out. Absolutely. So when I watch them put it into carriers and flip the carriers and do everything else, it's like you're handling the board more and more. The rails make sense. The other thing that was interesting is we did a lot of um, very high-end boards. And understanding uh, putting 201s 402s on design as a designer i love it man give me the smaller the better let me pound it in there and just make it happen it makes my design a little bit easier the signal integrity and power the signal integrity guys love it because no smaller is better we just have less discontinuity and such watching them struggle with 201s and if you've never seen a 201 on a board and when they're trying to do a rework especially over at the at the quality inspection right i'm um, i have an absolute I'm in awe of the people doing the quality inspection. The fact is they can look at that, and I can't tell if that thing's tombstoned or not. And they go, oh, no, it's tombstoned. And they hand solder it back on. It's like, you're kidding me. Hell, the... okay, this is cool. <laughs> but the question always comes up is, why? Why did it tombstone? Right. What's going on there? How are you making that actually happen? Right. And then what can I do in my designs to do it? When you're building five boards and you're doing a prototype, it doesn't matter so much. It's like, okay, great. You touch the boards and you spend 10 minutes touching a board and it's not a big deal. Right. When you're doing 10,000 boards, 100,000, a million boards, you can't be touching. They've got to go through the first time. Obviously, there's the prototype runs and everything else. You do right. five, 10, then you do 100, then you do 1,000 and you build up and you start to ramp. But understanding why that process happens is always fascinating to me. So with the 201s, this one instance I learned was... I had 201s next to a charge ball connector, a Samtec charge ball connector, high-speed connector. The charge ball connector needed a thicker stencil, and the 201 needed a thin, thinner stencil because if you look at it from a paste point of view, look at a volumetric efficiency of the paste. Right. How do you know how much volume is going to be on there, where it's going to go? That is what they're always battling. This is why you end up having, when you do put your paste down on your board, they never use that, almost never, unless it's very specialized for maybe some of the... Some of the linear tech power supplies and stuff like that are very specific about the window painting they do and things. But for the most part, they're always doing something funny to the paste to control the volume of paste down. So what I really learned was is keeping the 201 so close to the charge ball because they needed such a thicker stencil because they had to put a certain volume down. And then you had these 201s right next to it was causing problems. And for a whole bunch of reasons, they couldn't get, they were putting too much paste in the 201s and that was causing bridging and also causing Absolutely. all this other stuff. Absolutely. And the thing about the line and especially the quality control and um, inspections is they just fix it. A lot of the times they just go, oh, no problem, Chee -chee, done. there you go. And you never learn from it. Right. So this is why I learned when I'm walking and if you come, when you do your walkthroughs here, right. go look at what they're, what they're touching up. Right. Say, why did you touch that up? Especially if you're doing your own boards. Now, here's here's the biggest thing. You get a board coming through. Obviously, if it's a, a, a very simple board where the smallest thing's on there is an 0805, eh, it wouldn't worry so much about yeah, it. Yeah, there's nothing to worry about. Yeah, it's, it's standard technology. It's when you start to push. When you push right. the edge of technology, watch your board being built. Ask to come over here when they're going to build it. And walk around. Look at the quality inspectors that are looking at it and look at the rework. What are they touching? 
Are they touching it because it was a manufacturing process because of handling? Okay, well, maybe that's something you can handle. Or is it this charge ball 201 or is it something else? And you learn more from what they're touching up and they're going. And then talk to the uh, manufacturing engineer also. A lot of times you're dealing with the salespeople. The sales guys are awesome. I mean, they, they want to go out and they're great for getting a beer or two or something else like this. And they want your business and that works out awesome. But you want to learn what's going on there. You can talk to the manufacturing engineers. And they'll look at you and they'll kind of go, I had one guy look at me and says, you designed that? I go, yeah. He says, I don't like you anymore. I'm like, oh, <laughs> God, what I do now? Um, you learn from them because Absolutely. they 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 overcome everything that you do because they're that good. Um, all your mistakes, they overcome. So I always looked at them and going, okay, how do I do better? And I asked them, not the sales guys or anything else. I asked the manufacturing engineer and I asked the rework people. And it's like, how do you do that better? That is totally true. That is that is great advice yep. uh, for PCB designers. Yep. Like, don't think that you're done, you know, when you just kind of finish your layout, send it over to the manufacturing. Oh, I'm done. I'm going on my weekend or we can get away or my vacation um no you really can't and that's the thing is the it doesn't and it doesn't stop there i mean once you get that then look at the box build and the box build is always interesting um looking at the box build how the cabling is going together and where it flows i always found that fascinating especially when they're doing testing and everything else too is you look at the entire process I mean, we're curious beings. This is why we're designers we're engineers man we love doing this kind of thing sure yeah and it's like i want to learn if you stop learning, then you really don't belong in the field anymore because you've always got to learn. You no, know, you're absolutely right. So you're kind of laying out some good foundational things for every designer. They should talk to their fabricator, talk to the assembler, learn from, you know, what the how they're helping to overcome, you know, the manufacturing challenges. Yep. Learn from that. Yep. Just because you get a board doesn't mean you're done, right? Like there's a lot that you have to dive into, right? Exactly. Get your, get your hands dirty on the manufacturing side. No, it makes perfect sense. Those are good advices. So Sierra Circuits has been working very hard for electrical engineers and PCB designers like yourself on our engineering tools. These are engineering tools to help you design faster. We want to reduce your design time and get the design right the first time. So our top tools on our website, number one is the PCB Stackup Planner. Uh, knowing that you have a good stack up right away uh, for your design. Number two is the bomb checker. It will do basic scrubbing, make sure your ref deses are good, your MPNs are good, the MPN matches the description. You know, all these are amazing features of the bomb checker. Uh, we also have an impedance tool, uh, which is based on Maxwell's equations. Uh, and it, these are all for free for the PCB designer and electrical engineer. You know, please go check them out. It's all for you. Uh, then let's continue with your career. So after uh, Rocket. After Rocket, um, I was in the contract manufacturing world for quite a few years and it was yeah. time for a change. And I saw an opening at Cadence. And Cadence had an opening for a, uh, the product manager for Allegro. This is the tool I've been working on since version 7.6 on a Spark, Ultra Spark 2. <laughs> for all those guys that are that old, yeah, that's what I was working on. Um, and uh, it was a beautiful way of changing it up. Um, and it was probably one of the best moves I ever made. Um, Cadence, I went from uh, at Rocket where it was kind of the same thing. I mean, manufacturing is manufacturing. You grind out, it's kind of the same thing. Yeah, you get your differences here and differences there. Um, the opportunity at Cadence opened up, and it it was a great challenge. I had no idea. Yeah, it's a big shift, right? Manufacturing oh, yeah. to basically software, correct? I'm, I'm, I'm marketing. And marketing. I'm marketing, of all things. <laughs> I have no idea why they did this, but I'm, I'm, all, I'm all on. They haven't gotten rid of me yet. I hope they don't. <laughs> Um, but no, it's actually a marketing role and yeah. it's a product marketing and it's a product manager for marketing. I think what really comes, which really appeals to me is I can influence, I mean, I've designed hundreds and hundreds and thousands, thousands of boards and I've overseen even more than that. I mean, we, I can't count how many designs went through our, our shop and everything else over the years, but I know how to design a board. I've been there. My hands are dirty. I've done all of that work. I've seen the, how the sausage is made in the factory, per se. And what I found was when I got to Cadence, Cadence has got some of the smartest people I've ever met. I am 
I'm in awe, literally, most of the time I'm talking to these people, what they know and how they do things. Um, very impressive. The reason why people don't leave that company, and this job doesn't come open very often, is because no one wants to leave. And we had somebody retire out, and he said, okay, great, I'm, I'm done. And that came open, it landed, and I was able to get it. That's great. I feel fortunate. Yeah, congratulations uh, on that. I'm, I, am, uh, I feel very blessed every day I'm there. So tell us how it's different. I mean... Instead of working on designs and you're working through with engineers, I have two basic roles that I'm working with. Uh, marketing side of it, which is I am bringing out, uh, like we have a new release coming out, 24-1 is coming out. And so uh, me and the team that I'm on, our little business unit, uh, there's four of us there. These guys are awesome. We actually work at coming up with all the documentation to go out to salespeople and also presenting it out, doing things like this. Um, marketing, PCB West, PCB East, um, PCB Carolina, other events. I'm kind of the face person to Allegro, you might say. Oh, um, but also I bring a lot in because I have such experience. I've been designing and using the tools forever. Um, and I'm not as expert as some of the people. We have some product engineers that are truly in, um, beyond impressive um, on their knowledge of the tool and knowledge of design. Um, but I come in from a different point with all my manufacturing background sure. into this. So I have a kind of a unique world. Um, a lot of the people at Cadence have been there for 30 years, 20 years, 40 years. Um, and they know the tools better than anybody else. But they don't have necessarily the outside experience. That's changing. We have a series of people retiring. This is, man, guys, every, all it the happens. gray hair people, man. We're, it we're, happens. We're, 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 there's a generational change happening here. The same thing with PCB designers. It happens, yeah. So, so how does let's take a step back okay. and dive in a little bit on this. So, how does Cadence, specifically for Allegro, decide on what are the good features that they should focus on, and you know what's coming out in the next release? Like, what's the process? Take we us listen. That. We listen to our user base. Okay. We do. We listen, and we are always listening. We are talking to our user base. We are talking to our companies. We. Are, do all sorts of things to find out where they want us to go. And our plans are three years out, and we kind of plot this thing out, and we look at it, and it, what's better for the whole. I wish we had the ability to do everything. I wish we had a 4,000-person R&D team. <laughs> I know Michael Jackson would be in heaven with that, being able to the amount of stuff that we could do. But... We, we literally look at what our customers need. We, look at, we ask them what they want, and we also ask them what the problems are. So one of the ways of approaching this, if I ask a customer, hey, what do you need? They go, I need this. And I'm like, okay, why? And we go back and we ask why. And we start to dig, dig into why do you need this? And the why is always, they say, I need that. This is why. Well, we really need that right there. And, that, and this path up to this solves about three other problems that these other people are doing. So let's go there in the next year or two or three. And we kind of plot that out. And this is what the product engineers and uh, uh, the product, what we all do at Cadence. This is like, how do we solve the real big problems for our customers going forward? Um, that's, that's really what we do. So yes, we do get beat up. Hey, this doesn't work. Those are, those are low level stuff. We're always working on it. We're always fixing things up. Um, bring it to our attention, and we work on it. We really do. We do pay attention to everything. Um, we listen to everybody. Um, but we decide on, like, hey, this is where the majority of our customers need to go. We're seeing these big rocks we want to move. This is where we want to go. And sometimes it takes a couple of years to get there. But when we get there, it's like, oh, wow, this works so well. This is what I needed. Yeah, thank you. Got it. Wow, that's that's really good. That sounds yeah. like a well-oiled machine in lots of ways. It is. And you can't go wrong listening to your customers. I definitely like that. <laughs> so uh, let me ask this. So I know this big change that's happened in the industry is everyone's talking about AI. And oh, AI. AI yes. can affect everything that you do. Yep. Um, but specifically for, you know, customers of Cadence Allegro, right? Um, what's What exists today um, as an, as kind of AI features, uh, and you know, where is this going? How do you see this is going to impact what the designer does on a daily basis and how they do it? 
Great question. So AI is, we have, from the PCB designer's point of view, we have one tool that is still in development called XAI. And right now it is, we have a limited release. We have several customers we're working with it. It's in, still in development. Um, come over to PCB West. We'll talk a little bit about it, and I can show you a little bit there. Um, you go up onto our website, and you'll see a little bit about it there. Essentially what it is, um, let's back up here. What's the problem? Okay. The problem that we often have is how designing and a board. When you design a board and you're trying to do the placement, the amount of decisions that you need to do the placement is quite massive. Um, people don't realize how complicated of a problem this is. We've had a lot of people look at it and go, oh, it's not that, it can't be that difficult, we can do this. Right up until you really start looking at it. <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of decisions need to be made. A lot of the decisions need to be made. Sure. Um, a lot of the decisions need to be made inside of it. And it's like, literally, the amount of decisions are more molecules than they are in the universe. That's <laughs> the kind of number that it is when you're wow. doing a standard PCB. So the XAI tool that we are creating um, is starting out with just placement. How do you get a good placement going? And the idea behind it is actually pretty simple. As a designer, how many times do I have to place the same 3.3 same LDO? How many times am I going to place the same thing for my USB 3.0? How many times am I going to place this 6... Um, uh, a six channel, whatever, or whatever you're gonna do. This allows you to go ahead and do placements a lot easier and very accurate. Um, it'll be driven from the schematics, it'll be driven from SIPI information that'll be inside the design. Lots of things are coming up onto it. So the way of looking at it is, the AI tools that are coming on for the PCB designer are not there to replace your job. They're there to make your job easier, to get rid of some of the redundant, boring stuff that we always do. That's where we want to go. Um, are we going to replace the designers? No. I can't imagine that. <laughs> if you keep your mind open and utilize the tools that you have at your hand, then you won't be replaced and you will be a better designer. Because let's be frank, I never enjoy, once I design a circuit once, I don't want to do it again. Yeah. I mean, the worst thing you love to do, the worst thing the designer wants to do is repeat their work. So by having a placement tool that does 80% of the work for you, allows you to challenge, uh, work on the more challenging parts of the design. This is what makes it easy to do. This is what makes it actually a lot of fun. So it's an augment. It's just another tool in your quiver uh, from a PCB designer. So there's lots of things that are happening inside the, inside the AI world, inside of Cadence. Um, there's talks about all sorts of things, and we have several different parts of the optimality is another one, which is creating um, uh, optimality. You can actually look that up on our, on our website also. Several different AI tools that are coming up. Uh, we have a lot of that coming. I can't say too much more. But there's some well, really so, cool stuff. So today, is there something that a designer can use um, to help them design better, faster, or is it coming it's coming it's coming okay yeah it's we so yeah. it's coming it's coming don't know exactly when but it'll be here soon okay great so and maybe more information at pcb west would be um released. pcb west i don't think we'll have any more information but i can okay. talk a little bit about it and um we're we're still trying to come up on the timeline when it'll be released okay so so as a pcb designer i sh just to paraphrase basically mm -hmm. AI and the tool, the way that uh, Cadence and other tool vendors are thinking of AI is how do you make uh, PCB designers' job less repetitive? Uh, how do you help them reduce the number of decisions an engineer has to make? Maybe the software can help with a good number of those decisions. More fundamentally, though, it's a shift left on what's happening. And this is something you're going to hear a lot of people talking about is shift left. Shift left is... Now, the electrical engineer with XAI, the electrical engineer, the mechanical engineer, can do preliminary placements. So they can go and play with it. I mean, the worst thing, as a designer, the one thing that always bothered me is they get this and say, here's a map of where I want to go. Right. Okay, great. I mean, I'm going to move this over here, move this here. Mechanical says I got to do this. I have thermal says I got to do this. So it's like, and, they, and they change it, and you go, I just lost a week. Great. Thanks, man. And then you go talk to your project manager, and they said, no, you don't, you don't get any more time. So you start burning the midnight oil to make it happen. This happens to everybody. This, yeah. is, this, is, how, this, this is, is how the design process works. Yes, very, very so, familiar. Yeah. 
so what ends up happening with um, XAI and with uh, the placement tools is you can place, have the electrical engineer placing things, looking at it going, I like how this flows. No, I want to move this here. No, I want that here. Mechanical can look at it. Thermal can look at it. A whole bunch of other people can look at it and they go, here we go. Here's the design and they can play with the form factor of the board. Hey, I got to make it a little bit wider, narrower, thinner, whatever you want to do with it. They go, this fits, this works. It kind of is you can form fit function. Okay, this is about 70 to 80% of the design. This is where we want to flow. Now you give it to the PCB designer. They've already gone through all of the uh, decisions on like a mechanical says, no, I got to put this 600 millimeter hole in the middle of your 500 millimeter board. I'm being facetious there, but yeah, sure. you get the idea. Yeah. Um, but now they have all of that put in there and you're starting from a point that is much more, um, ap you're starting from a point that's a lot better. So you're saying, so this, so what you just described, uh, I, I want to dive deeper into that because okay. I don't know if I understood it. So what I heard you say was that, you know, now there could be better collaboration yes. um, with this release um, between mechanical and EE um, to give the designer a more thoughtful requirements, let's say. It shifts left. It makes the requirements, standard flow right now is... The electrical engineer is almost done with the design. He mm -hmm. doesn't have his rules written out. Mechanical has got an idea for an outline for a board. They have an idea on thermal, if there's a thermal problem with it. And they throw it over and design go. And right. then it's a parallel. You've got the electrical engineer finishing here. You've got the mechanical engineer finishing here. And squished like a grape in the middle is the PCB designer. Right. Okay. And they kind of go, oh, we got to do this. And you got to move here. And you move back and forth. Often the mechanical and electrical are having direct communication, but, but in some cultures it's the PCB designer that becomes the center focus of everything. And then you have SIPI, then you also have your thermal solutions, depending on the type of solution you're doing. So what this is doing is, is, is this is tightening it up because the placement on this is fast. I mean, you go from 16 hours to hour, two hours. It's, it's very rapid on how it's moving, so you can do... 20, 30 different iterations and look at it and play with it and come up with creative ways of doing things. It's shifting the, the amount of energy left. It also is forcing you to put in rules early. It's forcing you to think about your thermal solutions, your mechanical solutions early. So when it comes to the design, you have a lot of that information in there. The PI, the, uh, the PDN, the uh, Power Delivery Network. How does that all fit into this? Sometimes that's told about it later. Do you have high voltage on it? Do you have high power on it when what's happening? By having that defined earlier, it really helps the designers be more efficient and allows us to be more creative in our solutions to everything. I mean, like I said in the very beginning, is, is we're always struggling. The PCB design is basically it's a, it's a three-dimensional puzzle that is limited by manufacturing, time, and physics. Physics, I will bump up against the edge and play on that edge as much as I can. Time, well, depends on how much I buy my, how, how much my project manager actually lets me go get away with. And manufacturing is, is when I'm always talking to you guys going, hey, right. what, can I, what can I really do with this? So from your perspective, this is fascinating. I yeah. can't wait to see uh, what, what uh, Cadence comes up with. And, you know, uh, what from your perspective and Cadence's perspective, what makes a good PCB designer? A good PCB designer? Yeah. Because, uh, you know, you talked about methodology and the process and how it's going to change. You must have some opinion on, you know. What... Oh, I have opinions. <laughs> um, what makes a good PCB a designer? A PCB designer. Um, you remember I said a special kind of stupid, and I was being facetious on that, but it's actually true. You need to have a special person that can do the work. Um, they need to be able to put their head into a puzzle. These are just big puzzles. They are amazingly fun puzzles. Um, so backing up a designer, you've got to be able to get into your head and be in the design. And you they literally, I used to have an alarm go off about every two hours. Otherwise, I wouldn't move. My wife would, when I was working from home, she would walk in there and say, it's, you haven't moved in six hours. You really need to get up and do something here. <laughs> Designers do that. You get into this zone. The music goes on. You get going. And it's fun. You get lost into it. Um, Designers are gamers. Um, a lot of them do the gaming and stuff like that. Some of them, but we're, come from all over. One of the best designers that I know, um, we used to call him La Machine. Um, he was a lawyer. 
Oh, and, interesting. Uh, yeah, he was uh, one of the cleanest, best designers. Uh, amazing gentleman, absolutely amazing gentleman. Um, and uh, but they come from everywhere. So what we look for in a designer really is: can you sit and do this, and can you solve the puzzles? Can you communicate? Because a lot of the times the communications. Um, one of the current the, um, best designers I know right now, Marine, is uh, <laughs> at Rocket. When I ever had any difficult customer, no, give them to Marine. Marine would be able to handle them, communicate with them, and make them feel good and control them. And it becomes a part of your, the how you work with everything. Um, also, I look for designers that want to learn. Don't just tell me what to do. That's, when you get told what to do, you're a CAD jockey. You're not a designer. Why? When they ask why, hey, what does that do? I don't know. Let's go figure it out. Wait a minute. Why is that power network not working? Why is this not working? Okay. Wait a minute. How do I do this simulation? Can I do the simulations and don't don't deal with this SIPI guys? Yes, you can. Here you go. Here's licenses. Rock and roll. Learn. Never stop learning and never stop asking why and always pushing it. How do you make it better? Those are the kind of people that are looking for. Um, and if you want a challenge, it's awesome. It doesn't matter what your background is. Literally, it's pretty much all on the job training. There's a few places out there that will teach you, but um, it really is something that you learn on the job and just finding a good place to go is where it is. But there's positions. Um, they're not hard to come by right now because we have a – one of the things about PCB design right now is the uh, there's a bunch of us retiring. So I'm – there's basically two generations we skipped. We got the guys that are 50, 60 years old that have been doing this for 30 or 40 years. They're retiring, um, and they're leaving the field. And then you've got the third, the 40s-somethings, 50s, don't exist. The 20s and 30s do. And so we kind of skipped a generation, and almost a generation and a half. The 20s and 30s is I watch them coming up, and they're impressive. They think differently. Um, they're used to having multiple inputs. They're used to looking at things differently, looking it up on the web, figuring it out. Um, it's kind of a different breed. Um, the old designers, we've been doing this for a long time. It's like we get a little stuck in our ways. Uh, this is the way I do it. The young ones don't know enough and haven't learned the bad habits that we have to make things happen. And I'm saying that tongue in cheek because we all have the bad habits, but we always want to learn more. But yeah, those are the kind of people I look for. No, it makes sense. I think, uh, you know, some of the things that you said are good for life lessons, too. Yes. You know, being inquisitive, asking why, yes. um, not resting on your laurels, and, you know, being proactive. I think all those are, are really, really good. Thank you for listening to our podcast. The podcast is for you electrical engineers and PCB designers out there to learn from. And we also have an amazing discussion forum that we recently launched called Sierra Connect. So go there right now, post your questions, and industry experts will respond to your questions. It's an amazing resource that you should take advantage of. So you basically uh, had your you know, first part of your career in manufacturing. Now you're in software and marketing of, of software. Mm -hmm. um, what what uh, technical challenges, both manufacturing-wise and software-wise, um, have you noticed, um, you know, you know, is the AI software difficult to program, relatively easy? Um, is the, you know, is there a big manufacturing shifts that are happening? Anything like that, if you have any thoughts on that. Oh, where to start. Okay. <laughs> we got a couple different ways of going. Um, first of all, I'm going to address one thing with the AI. Um, with XAI specifically, it's simple. It doesn't take anything. Remember I said that we have mechanical engineers and electrical engineers working on it, not right. PCB designers? Right. That tells you how simple the software is. Sorry, guys, <laughs> I didn't mean to. Uh, no offense to the electrical engineers and mechanicals out there. I've seen what you guys deal with, mechanical, especially in SolidWorks. Woo um, anyway, what with the AI tools are meant to be easy. And okay. it's like a good a AI done right, in my opinion, and I'm not an expert in this, is you almost don't know what's happening. It just, it just happens. It's like it should happen like this, so it does happen. That is what a good piece of AI. This is where XAI is going. Okay, it God. just happens. Um, manufacturing trends and design trends. Um, we actually have three different trends that I see going on right now. Okay. Um, the big one is wearables. 
I mean, everybody talks about, you know, you got the goggles, you got wrists, you got watches and earbuds and rings and <laughs> vests and socks and everything else in the world. I have no idea. Um, there's some unique challenges in that. Um, the What I've been listening to is with wearables, especially when you get into stuff, is weight. Something I never thought about a PCB board. The Usually when I had like some of bigger stuff, it was like we worried about weight. And I was like, hey, this is a 35-pound PCB board. we got to put some stiffeners in here because this thing is <laughs> crazy. But that's more on to the high voltage and EV stuff, and I'll talk about that in a second. Sure. But um, with the wearables and stuff, it's all flex. So the manufacturing is really, really challenging um, because it is custom to every single piece. Um, the stack up on these flexes changes constantly. How do you simulate? Most of these flexes, when you're dealing with wearables, don't have a, have a return path, a solid ground plane. Um, they're dealing, you, you do every game in the world. You analyze every single component on it. They deal in micrograms. How many micrograms can I take off of this design? Because every microgram makes a difference. Wow. And they deal with that. So it's like, can I shave off um, uh, 0.001 millimeters of board over here? Can I make this cheaper? Can I make this copper thinner? It's a different way of challenging. But what comes upon that, and back to our education side, yeah. is having the tools to be able to do it. You are bumping against the edge of physics. This is signal integrity and power integrity. You're playing games. How do you know that your signal integrity is working? You got PCI 3, um, USB 3.0, uh, Firewire, and I don't know what they have. Firewire, that's old. Um, but Thunderbolt and things like this that are going into it. I throw all these technologies. But the power, high speed's easy. Power's difficult. So if you don't have a constant power plane, you got other things on there, how do you make sure your power and delivery network is actually working? This is where you have to understand your tools. And this is where the Cadence really comes in handy. Um, the Cadence tool sets with InDesign Analysis allows you to go ahead and make sure you are designing as you're designing it, you're designing it right so it'll work. Um, so the manufacturing, the flex, and everything else like this. This is, a, a, it, this is happening now. Um, and you're seeing it. And you guys do some incredible flex circuits here. And it really is a challenge to do. The other place that, um, there's two more. The other one is... Um, big power, uh, big power, the batteries. Everybody has a battery pack system. Everybody has these things. You've got high voltage, high bat high amperage um, on these battery packs and dealing with that is a different world. That's high voltage um, separation. Um, and when you're designing the boards, you got to think about it. Okay, I've got a solid, I got a relay that's going on the board. I've got a thousand amps going through this. How the bloody heck do I put a thousand amps through that one pad? And coming up with it, but then that's easy. But then how do you assemble it? And then how do you unassemble it? Assembling it once easy. You can go through the oven. The oven brings everything up and it works, as long as it can go through the oven. But if you start having big through-hole components that have that kind of stuff on there, it's like how do you thermal tie that properly? How do you end up knowing you have enough, um, enough copper on that so you don't have a, a short circuit or have a fuse built into it, um, but you can still work it in the factory? Because this is this goes back to like I was saying before is you're building something like that. Watch how they're assembling it. Watch them, and when they have a problem, how do you deal with that? I mean, sometimes I remember them coming out and bringing a bloody almost a blowtorch to pull some stuff off. Jeez. Um, but then also being conscientious of the power, and this is where the education comes in. If I've got a 400 volt differences on two different layers here, okay, how do I manage that? How do I make sure I don't have uh, I don't have arcing over and it doesn't break down over a period of time? Is understanding a lot of those mechanical processes, electrical processes that happen, that's something that you really do need to pay attention to. Um, the other one that's actually going big, and this goes back to your AI, okay. is the hyperscalers. Okay. Uh, hyperscalers are the NVIDIAs and the Microsofts and all the rest of these guys that are building these massive AI machines. And it's really, really cool. Um, and it's a different way because the AI chips, I mean, as you know, Cadence is, does a lot into the AI world. We have a large uh, part of our business is our chip business. And we actually write this, we make the software to make chips. I don't know if anybody knows that. We do the chip, we do the package, we do the board, we do everything and all the simulation in between. This is why we're, this is why we're in a very unique place. So we are working with these companies and it is quite amazing 
um, when you're designing these boards because they are power hogs. And it's like, how do you deliver that much power into this BGA? Okay, I got a 4,000 pin BGA and I got to bring one volt at 30 amps to the core of it. How the bloody heck am I going to get that through 30 rows on the outside? And by the way, I can't have more than a tenth of a volt variance or less than that. I mean, you could have 1% variance on it or something. I mean, th those are the problems we're facing. So again, these are different issues that are coming up that we're seeing a lot more of. Um, and it's fun. This is the fun part. This is the challenge. Again, this is where you understand what your tool sets are. And this is where the, the Cadence tool sets allow you to go ahead and actually simulate that as you're designing it. So, and actually design it right the first time. Because as I said before, I hate repeating my work. I'm sure most designers do. So if I have tools in my hand that know how to design the board right the first time, I'm going to use those. I'm going to learn how to use them. And I, that way it'll save me and my company a huge amount of time. Not to say you probably have a better haircut than I have because, man, this is all lost because we're doing too much work. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. So you named like kind of three trend areas. Anything more that you can think of? Any big trends? The one thing that's been talked about for a long time, long time is the 3D printing world. Okay. 3D printing of PCBs that's coming up. Um, this is something that is, uh, there are some great companies coming out there. We're following this very closely. Some of the RF people and some of the aerospace and defense are starting to use it limited. Okay. This is interesting. This is really fascinating because right now when we're designing our printed circuit boards, we're basically doing, I call it two and a half. I mean, you got, you got a plane and a via. All right, nothing big. When you start talking about 3D is, is quite literally, you could, you could design it looking like a pen and be circular, and there's no reference planes, no nothing else. And your form doesn't matter. You can make it a blob. You can make it a Borg cube um, and make that all work. This is something when we start going down that path, and this is where the industry is going to go, um, is you've got to have the simulation tools because your rule of thumb that all designers use, which I have a, I have a few opinions about this, the rule of thumb is something designers use all the time, but when you start getting into three-dimensional printing of a printed circuit board, there are no rule of thumbs. You can't. You have to simulate everything that you're doing. How do you do differential pair? Okay, it becomes a triaxial differential pair. How do you, because you need to have a return current on everything else. How do you match your impedance for a triaxial rotating, a triaxial um, pair going through a board at 22 and a half degrees and running around like a snake? Uh, you got to simulate that. So this is all where the simulation of everything else is coming into play. This is the next field that's coming in. This will be here in my life, and I'm looking forward to it. So does Cadence have tools right now that for that type of simulation, or is something yes. that you have to develop? No, the simulation tools, we, we have that. We are, that is where we are the leaders. Okay. Um, and we can do that day and night. And that's what we do, and that's actually where our strength is at. Okay. Wow. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. No, uh, just to reflect on some of those trends that you're talking about, we do see a lot more flex, um, and people trying to push the boundaries of what can flex actually mm -hmm. do. Mm -hmm. Um, and manufacturing flex is totally different, um, versus a rigid, uh, or a rigid flex. So we're yep. definitely seeing that of course, power, we're seeing that. Yep. Um, so yeah, we're, we're definitely kind of seeing some of these things. Um, that you're mentioning. So uh, it's interesting to hear from you and, uh, and, and get your inputs on that. Um, so, you know, just one thing that came to mind, typically I've seen designers, you know, they focus on an area, you know, of design, right? Whether it's wearables or whatnot. Um, do you see that changing at all? Or, I mean, do you see designers having to kind of dabble in many different things now? Or are they still going to be kind of focused on one particular technology? I actually think that they need to focus on multiple areas. Okay. That's the fun of it. How many times do you want to design the same watch? How many times do you want to design the same footwear that has a wearable in it or glasses? It kind of gets boring after a while. One of the things that's actually kind of on the same lines here, and this is yeah. a field that is just now, you may have heard of something called the CHIPS Act. Yes. Okay, the CHIPS Act is uh, something that is changing how packaging and, and uh, chips are designed inside the United States. And you know there's billions, if not trillions, coming into it, and there's a lot of money for re-education on this. 
what I'm also seeing on this is this is an opportunity for PCB designers to expand their knowledge. Part of the CHIPS Act is there's a large part of it for re-education where you can get go to classes and have, and there's some stuff on this you can do. PCB Carolina um, that we're going to has a few, uh, has a speaker on this, Dr. Hopkins. I'll uh, be talking a little bit about this. Okay. But you can look into it on the CHIPS Act. But anyway, what this is is right now CHIPS, Designing the silicon is one thing. Designing the package that it goes into is another, and then designing the board. Those three are going to start to blur together and being almost done parallel and simultaneously. And the person who's actually designing the chip is going to have to know a heck of a lot about the board. Chips are getting more and more complicated as far as the packaging of the chips um, is going to get is getting more and more with 2.5 and 3D chips and all sorts of stuff that's happening inside of it. The interposers are getting extremely complicated. Um, the amount of technology that's coming into them is there. I actually see that designers leaning over and understanding how the chips work a little bit, because guess what? If you're on the Allegro tools, it's the same tool. It's the same basic tool. It's got some cool features that are meant for the chip design, but there's a lot of the tool is actually the same as your PCB design. So being able to cross back and forth onto that is something that would be good. What have people have said is, well, there's not a lot of package design here. That's true. That's going to be changing with the CHIPS Act. When they bring everything back on shore, more package design will have to happen here. So this is what we're actually seeing. So the designer picking up, and that could be as simple as going from wearables into high power into supercomputers, but then that usually depends on the company you're with. I mean, if you're with one of the big guys that are around here, you're going to be locked into a certain area. The way of expanding it and actually having more fun with it, again, keep your knowledge going. Pick up a, and start looking about chip package design and start playing into that world and be paying attention to it. And because I think that's going to change a lot in the next three or four years. Yeah, no, we definitely see that too. People wanting more high density uh, interconnect, you know, on what's supposed to be a PCB. Yeah. And, you know, people putting more intellectual property into the PCBs, be yeah. it more dense or, or RF. We see a lot of RF type stuff happening. Do you, is that something that's on? Your radar, Cadence's yes. radar? Yes. Um, Cadence's radar. Um, Cadence is um, really good at looking at where the trends are going. And uh, we are very good about buying the right companies. We expand our knowledge in two ways. We, we homegrown it like we did with XAI, or we purchase companies. Um, AWR is a company we purchased uh, four years ago, three and a half years ago. Okay. And they are RF specialists. And we are integrating that constantly into the PCB design flow, into system capture um, for our front end tools and everything else like that, for all the simulation tools and everything else. Um, so we're very conscientious of where the market is going. Um, so this is how Cadence, this is why Cadence is the leader in all this. We, we go around, we find where things are going. And we go, great, let's expand into that world. This is about Anna Rood. Watching Anna Rood, what he's been the CEO, uh, president and CEO for three years now, maybe, um, two and a half, three years. Watching him do this has been impressive. I'm actually, I'm, I'm tickled the way he does everything. Um, just looking at the future, where to go, where to invest. It puts us on great grounds. That's great. No, it sounds like Cadence has a unique position in the industry, yes. being able to provide tools and, you know, multiple layers of yep. electronics manufacturing. Exactly. That's, that's amazing. That's really amazing. If you haven't heard of Sierra Circuits, Sierra Circuits is a PCB manufacturer and assembler all in one, located in the Bay Area, uh, right around all the innovation that's happening. And Sear Circuits is capable of building everything from start to finish, uh, from simple standard product to uber complex, HDIs, flexes, rigid flex, high speed applications, you know, anything that you can think of, we pretty much can build. Uh, and we do it quick. Uh, so if you need to maintain your schedule and be on time, Sear Circuits is your vendor of choice. Okay, so Patrick, I want to ask more a little bit about, you know, running a design firm, like mm -hmm. being a designer and running a design firm. And so I guess what I understand and realize now is you are a separate design firm company and you merged with Rocket. And in Rocket, 
you were still doing the design work. Yes. Right. So, yep. um, you know, and I, I see the benefit there, right? That once you do your work, you know, you're literally within an assembly company and manufacturing company and you're getting all the DFM feedback, Yep. you know, right there. So that must have made the designs better, like quicker. It did. It actually, because if I had, if you're designing on the edge mm -hmm. and that's a lot of the stuff we did at Rocket was on the edge. I mean, we were doing some crazy stuff. I could go out on the floor and go talk to the guys on the line saying, hey, how would you handle this? Or I talk to the, the manufacturing engineers and go, this is what we're doing. How far can I push this edge? And we look at the design and they look at it and we come up with a conclusion and say, hey, you can do this or I can do that. You learned a lot. And what, one thing is, is, is we developed our own DFM team. And they, like I said before, they are awesome. And in that process, we learned about what, it, what you really need to look at. What are the problems you come up with? And... Right now, when everybody does a DFM and you get it back and you get the DFM back and you get it from the fab and you get it from the contract manufacturer and you look at it and it's like, eh, crap, 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 I'm not going to pay attention to that, I'm not going to pay attention to that. You, you, when you were building this thing and what we did at Rocket was really brilliant and the fact is we got rid of a lot of the questionable things. Um, so we made it very simple. The feedbacks were six, seven, eight lines, nine lines at the most. And it really concentrated on what really needed to be corrected. And we look at that and you go, why? And that was part of the question I always ask is, is, why was this a problem? Why didn't I catch this? This is also why it goes back to the tools and utilizing your tools, which I didn't talk much about. Uh, but utilizing the tools that you have to actually make them work even better and work for you. Yeah, so, so give some specifics. So on. DFM. Um, there are, um, the gold standard of DFM is the, uh, NPI tool from the mentor. Okay. This is the old Valor tool. Okay. And that's just what that is. They have been the gold standard of everything about DFM for 30 years, forever, long as I've, long as I've been in the field. Um, what, but the problem is, is you have to take your design and you have to go through this other tool, put it in there. It feeds back a bunch of information. You have thousands if not tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of false positives you get to sort through there these are my real issues bring it back into your tool and make the change and you go back and forth and you have this exchange that goes back and forth you waste time that takes day i mean post process on a standard dfm um, design took four to six hours okay and just because of the back and forth and post processing it and checking it and everything else if you had that capability built into your tool, like we do at Cadence, it's called Design True, where we can make all those same checks. Therefore, as you're designing the board, your DFM is being built in, and you don't. When you do send it out for DFM, I still recommend you send it out for DFM. I'm okay. I'm taking my Cadence off for a second. My my engineering hat's on. It's like I never trust a tool to check itself. Okay, but I right. trust Cadence is going to find 99.99 percent of that stuff. Okay, engineering Cadence hats back on. <laughs> um, but it's a the design tree allows you to go ahead and know if you're going to have DFM issues, and this makes your life easier oh, as absolutely. a manufacturer. It's like, great, I didn't make that stupid mistake, because if you look at it, when you're gerbering out, okay, I'm still using that old term. When you're post processing gerbering out, right. it's going to be the seventh or eighth time you've done it on the board. It's two o'clock in the morning. Your your wife is saying, "Come to bed. What the heck are you still doing up?" Um, and you're hungry. Um, or you're eating bad, which is usually what we end up doing. You have a can of Coke and you have a donut in front of you or something stupid like that. Um, then you, you make your mistakes. And by having a tool that can catch the mistakes as you're making them and let you know real time what's happening, that is worth every single ounce of it. That's worth everything. Because the DFM goes off and you, if you're sending it overseas, you lose a day there and it like lose a day back. You make the changes, you lose another day. You could lose, lose three, four, five days in a DFM process when you're dealing with overseas. If you have the correct tool that Allegro X has that capability of with Design True to make the design happen now, then it's one set. You send it over, DFM's done, you're on manufacturing. You just saved yourself four days. That makes a big difference. That does. I agree. So uh, I'm thinking about an example uh, that you brought up, which is putting like a small O201, you know, having space in your requirements for O201s um, versus, you know, another type of component. Does the cadence constraints manager, can it handle that Absolutely. a little bit? Like we can, 
Go ahead. So, Allegro X Constraint Manager and is incredibly powerful. We can control everything. And if it's not there, we have capabilities of writing scripts um, through Ravel or through just standard scripts to do it. The greatest power of, one of the great powers and beautiful things about the Allegro X tools and the Allegro X platform is its customization. If you're in, we actually have this going on right now, we have a, uh, a company that has some very special requirements for Flex. They are doing some really cool stuff, and they said, we need to check for this. And we go, we don't have that kind of check. That's an intro. What the devil would you need to check that for? Right. But they, they, they did it, and it's like, okay. So typical software. Um, we put that in there. We go, okay, yeah, we can write this into the tool. It's not a problem. It'll take a year to come out because we have our releases once a year, and just wait for it. Or we can do it in an ISR, but we try not to do that. But, or we can write you this, a, a custom script and call the Ravel, which is this manufacturing, and that allows you to check it now. Um, and then we will develop that and make that into the tool eventually. So um, Cadence has the, if you want to check it, we have the capability of checking it. And if it's not there, we can add it pretty easily. So that's the power of it. This is what Mentor, the Mentor Valor tool had thousands of checks inside of it. And some of them I look at, and they're they're buggy, and they've been around forever. I can't count how many CCRs I had against their stuff when it didn't quite work right. Um, but uh, we basically duplicated that, made it better, and we have more flexibility um, into making it work to make your design better and make the contract manufacturer happier. Okay, well, amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> Anything to make your job easier. That's right. So... Um, Thank you so much uh, for all the insights you have given us no and problem. given to the PCB designers. And, you know, what an interesting career going from manufacturing to software to marketing. I um, love it. You know, and, and I think that's just so amazing. So thank you so much for sharing all of your insights uh, with our listeners and watchers. So. I appreciate you having me here. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Thank you.